when you would come into the room, what would he start with? The Lynn drum, a drum set, depending on what he was working on, sit around on the piano for a little bit? Well, his favorite way to work was to have everything set up and routed so that he could work silently because he didn't like small talk. He, it interrupted that flow, that river, that Niagara Falls of ideas that was coming through his brain. It interrupted that flow if he had to have conversations. So if he could start a session with everything set up and routed, just headed to tape, happy, happy, happy. Um, sometimes you'd get a phone call saying, here's what he wants set up. Sometimes you'd come to the studio and there'd be a note waiting on the console saying, here's what he wants set up. If it was sunset, he would tell the front desk, tell the engineers, I want this set up. But you come in and uh, try to get as much routed for him, get his bass tuned, get his guitars tuned before handing it to him. Never so hand him an untuned instrument. Never hand him an untuned instrument so that he could move from one instrument to the other. He would stand at the drum machine, get a sound up. He had his Roland Boss pedals with flanger and delay and chorus and heavy metal and distortion and all the effects that he liked. And he, could, he could add those into the mix and he'd program his drum machine and we'd roll tape. Kick drum, snare, claps on a separate track, and then the mix coming out of the little mixer that was built into the drum machine, and that would be routed through the uh, effects. So he had his unique sound that would take up four or five tracks, sometimes six at the most, and then he'd lay down the bass and the chord changes with a keyboard pad or something like that, and basic basic parts. But I've uh, I've said that he had a watchmaker's knack for understanding how to complete an arrangement with the limitation of 24 tracks. So when you have fewer ingredients, just like a master chef, each ingredient has to carry more weight, which means each ingredient has to be more pure. Its, it's flavor has to, be un, it has to be independent from the other flavors. If you're, if you're a top chef, and he was a top arranger, and he once said, evidence of this is that he once said to me, in theory, any instrument in the mix should be capable of being the loudest thing in the mix. Uh -huh. Nothing should ever be in the background. Now, that applied to his arrangement style. After I left Prince, I had to unlearn Prince because if you tried to take his arrangement approach to a mix with a different kind of artist, it wouldn't work. Other people constructed something that was more like a pyramid. His was more like a sphere. You could move your spotlight of attention pretty much anywhere on most Prince records Focus on any instrument you want and get a treat. Yeah. <laughs> no instrument was dependent necessarily on others. That's a unique way of arranging. Not everyone arranges like that. But he, he, he had that musical mind that was almost, almost like a kaleidoscope where you could rotate your perspective on this record and it would work. You mentioned the groove being the most important thing. Another thing he taught me was... If a mix is working, you should be able to mute all the vocals and the whole top line, melody and, and the hooks and things like that, and it should work with just the rhythm section. Your sounds and your performances should be strong enough that you could do a breakdown on the dance floor and no one wants to stop dancing. That record doesn't lose pressure. Yeah. Wow. And, and that, that was hard to achieve with other artists, but for him, that's how he thought musically. So he built his records that way. I just interviewed Jeff Barry, who is an amazing songwriter with Phil Spector. They did Be My Baby with the Ronettes and just all this stuff. And I'm a musician as well, and I write songs. And I was talking to him about how I create the groove first and then the melody. Mm. And for his whole career, he always thought of an idea and the melody, and then they yeah. would put music to the melody. Yeah. But Prince would get the groove going and then come up with not them. always no, no uh, not on always. his on his ballads on on ballads and and uh, well, things like Computer Blue or. I think the song Pop Life, written on piano first, where yeah. he'd have melody and he'd, he'd write out his lyrics and then he'd come into the studio with lyrics already written and he knew the melody, he knew the chord changes, he knew the sections, and then he would do the drum track and, and build it up from there. It was only the dance stuff that started with rhythm and then piled on top of it. But other times he worked from the top down, yeah. from the melody down to the rhythm. Sure, okay. And he loved his Mesa Boogie amp for guitars, correct? That was his choice, yeah. The funny thing about that is people often uh, in interviews will talk about him being experimental with his sounds and stuff, and I would always say, no, <laughs> absolutely, it was absolutely the opposite. Because he was so creative, he needed his methodology to be pretty, uh, pretty narrow lane. 
Because if he had been, if his creativity had drifted outside of those lanes to finding new guitars and new guitar sounds and all new keyboards and all new drum machines, it would have taken, it would have tapped resources that were being devoted to songwriting. So he, 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 he wanted his tools to stay exactly the same because he was so hyper-creative with the same tools, he could draw and paint for years. 